This year has been, well, different. It started out here and ended up there. Things we used to do there, we began doing here. If we're honest, we've all had moments of loneliness, frustration, and fear coming at us from here, there, everywhere. But we've learned to grow. We found out education isn't just in a classroom, that everyone is essential, and that the church isn't just a building, but a people willing to do whatever it takes to reach out and to help others, to give up things we love for the people we love more. So as you're beginning a new school year here, not there, or going back to work there, not here, we've learned that you can't do life alone and that we're never too far apart to be together. Amen.
just want to raise him up in this place. I want to raise a hallelujah to
another hallelujah right now. He's here in this place. He wants to do a work in our hearts today. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, he's already won the battle. So let's lift him up together today and give our hopes and our cares over to him. Body 
open up with your heart. We say that, but just listen to what God's saying to you. It's that still small voice just calling out to us. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Change to 
Amen. Do you guys believe that this morning? That God has moved mountains and he can do it again in our lives. Let's just pray to him today. God, we just thank you so much, not only for this opportunity to come together and worship you, to join together in your house, in your name, but God, the fact that you show up. So God, we pray, Holy Spirit, come. Be in and throughout this service and thank you so much for your faithfulness in doing that. And not just when we're in the church building, but God, when we go out, when we're walking around these walls that we swore would have fallen by now, when we're looking at these mountains and just stuck, when we feel stuck, God, we just pray that you would meet us here. Meet us here in this service today but meet us here and remind us that we are still in your hands, that we can have confidence in that and in who you are and in who you've called us to be. God, we pray that you would do it again. Do it again in us, out in our community, out in our world. And so God, we pray that you would bless this service, that you would bless the offering that we're about to give, both financially, but also just with our lives. God, we pray that you would just bless the offering of living our day-to-day, but living our day-to-day for you, to be a reflection of who you are. But God, we pray that you would just be in and throughout this entire service, that you would help open our eyes to something new. Speak to us and speak to our hearts. And don't let us leave here the same way we came in. But we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. You guys can grab a seat. We are so excited that you are here with us today, whether you are in the building or you're watching online. We are so excited to be here for you and there for you, to worship with you today as we look to God and finish up this series, Visible Secrets. And so this is the point where we continue in worship, the giving of our tithes and offerings. And a lot like the rest of our world, this doesn't look the way it used to. But there are multiple ways that you can continue to participate in giving for your church and your community. And so one of the ways is you go to the nas.church slash give, or you can give through the NAS app, which hopefully you guys know is a great resource, a way to access the home guide, lots of other resources, things for the kiddos, activities, all of that good stuff. Stay up to date and stay connected with your church family. You can also, if you're in person, drop your offering in one of the drop boxes as you leave the building, or you can drop it in your mailbox from home. But we are just so thankful for you, for your continued faithfulness and generosity and staying connected to your church in this way. But I have a couple of announcements for us this morning as we continue in worship, continue in our service. You guys have probably heard of something quite a lot recently, and that is Forward. Because here at the church, we believe so strongly in taking your next steps towards Christ together. And so we believe that no matter what your next step is, whether it's getting baptized or getting plugged into a small group, finding a place to serve, becoming an owner here at the NAS, we believe that your first step should be forward. And so we want to invite you to this. It's at 1030 in between our services. And so if you want to come next week, we would love to have you. Currently, it's solely online. And so you can get access all the information, get that Zoom link, all of that good stuff at the nas.church slash forward. But we would love to connect with you and help you take that next step together. And the next announcement 
I am super excited about because we just had Thanksgiving. We hope that you all had a wonderful holiday with your families, with your loved ones, with delicious food. But how many of you guys are excited for Christmas? It is now socially acceptable. I see some kids with hands high in the air. It is now socially acceptable to celebrate Christmas, to have your music, to have your decorations, all that good stuff. And I am so excited. But full disclosure, I definitely had my decorations up before it was socially acceptable. But guys, we are looking forward to Christmas with great expectation, but a lot like the rest of this year, the rest of this holiday season, a lot of it has been unexpected. And so that is what we're going to be talking about this Christmas season. And as we look at our Christmas Eve services, we have three services available for you guys to come and worship and participate in this with us. And it's going to be December 23rd, that's a Wednesday at 7 p.m., as well as December 24th at 4 and 6 p.m. And if you forget those times and dates, don't worry. You can find all of that information and more at the nas.church slash Christmas. But we are so excited to worship with you all for that. But like I said, we are wrapping up our series, Visible Secrets. And so as we prepare our hearts for the word that God has laid on Pastor Dale's heart, we want to start off with some scripture in Matthew. It's Matthew 6, 25 through 34. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Hmm. Sorry, I'm just thinking <laughs> how he takes care of the birds, and I ate one for Thanksgiving. That one didn't get very well taken care of. Plus birds, how much does it take to feed birds? I mean, they eat bird seed. Anyway, go ahead, sorry. Oh, okay. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you says he clothes the flowers, but then he said he doesn't clothe the flowers. That's just the way they are. I mean, if we walked around like the flowers did, we would not wear clothes. That would not be pretty. Nobody wants to see me walking around without clothes. God needs to clothe us. It's different than the lilies. I need to worry about clothing. At least y'all need to worry about whether or not I'm wearing clothing. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Uh, that's true. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. Um, this is funny. One of the passages, I think, also says that talks about worrying. Who of you by worrying? I mean, this says can add a single day to your life or can, can change one color of your hair. Now, I had the privilege of uh, going to Nashville and bringing my daughter back to college, from college. I mean, and there were some other college kids that were there. I had, happened to go to lunch with one of them this week. And um, his question was, they went to sit down at the restaurant, right? And the, the waiter says, Hey, is that guy coming in that you're normally with? He always gets a Coke and a Fundido Chorizo. So now you know where I'm eating. Um, they're like, you, you, and they go, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, the older guy, spiky hair, I'm gray. And so I'm going, I'm not gray. My hair's, my beard's gray. So this college student said, so are you like the president that since you've become the pastor here, did you just go gray since you became the pastor? I'm like, no, I was just, it's just the way it is. It's the way, it's not worry. It's not what worry is, but I, I worry. I tend to worry. You know, I, I think why? Why pray when you can worry, right? I mean, worry is a whole lot easier. But it's just easier to worry. How many of y'all feel like this? I'm gonna put up, a, put up that church sign. I was driving by, I saw this church sign. It says, don't let worries kill you, let the church help. And so I wanna ask you, some of you are laughing. Uh, by vote, if you're watching online, those of you that are watching online, if you felt like this meant the church can help you, 
with through your worries. If you feel like that's the case, give me a thumbs up if you're online watching. Just in a little chat there, give us a thumbs up. If you're in the building, raise your hand if you felt that's what it meant. Like, okay, now how many of you are more pessimists and you felt like it said, don't let worries kill you, let the church help kill you? If that's what you thought, of. okay, lots of pessimists, that's exciting today. I uh, got lots of pessimists in the crowd today. Well, I tend to worry about stuff. Um, I'm not coming you today, today though, with a, with a cure. I'm not, I don't have a fix-all. Here's the silver bullet. Uh, this is going to help you. Some of you that are anxious right now or you're worried, those of you that are watching online, you're anxious about all this COVID stuff and all the other things going on. Don't worry. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to come and say, oh, here's all you do and things will be great. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to work through some passages here, not only here in Matthew chapter 6, uh, but other things. Jesus tells us, you know, just don't, don't worry like that. So, oh, okay. I'll just stop worrying then since you said don't. It doesn't work that way, does it? Um, sometimes it's a little rougher. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 13, a little farther along. Jesus talks about a parable of a sower who goes out and he sows field all over the place, sows uh, seeds all over the place. And it falls on different soils. And the soils represent different lives and different people and how they accept the gospel. And there's one particular soil that I think at times I tend to identify with uh, a little bit more than maybe I should. Uh, but in, in verse 32 of Matthew 13, it says this, uh, there's seed that fell among the thorns. It represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. So in this whole chapter of Matthew six, Jesus has talked about a lot about money, about being generous, about where our life goes, a lot of those things. But then he, he goes on and talks about worrying just about the basic needs of life, your food, your clothes. Do you worry about those things? I'll be honest with you. I don't typically have to pray for my daily bread. I go to the grocery store, get the food. Um, thank God for that. I, I even do this. Like when you might want to try this as the food comes down the conveyor belt, I just thank God all for it right then. That way I don't have to say the blessing during the week. Just pray for it all right then as it goes down the conveyor. Uh, I seriously, I don't do that. But, but how do we take time to, to thank God for our daily bread, for things that he provides us? Uh, most of us have closets with lots of clothes in it. A pastor that I worked for, he said growing up, um, his closet was a nail on the back of his bedroom door. That was where he hung his extra shirt. That was all he had. He didn't have a closet in his bedroom. Now he said, I've got a room that's as big as my bedroom was that holds my clothes. That's how quickly things have shifted in America. Now we worry about all kinds of other things. To be honest with you, um, I'm the kind of person, I've had plenty to worry about in my life. So like just, just since I've moved here, just since I've moved here, I um, moved here and I owned a house in Florida where I had pastored it. The things had skyrocketed price-wise. I went to sell it and when I sold it, everything plummeted. And so I, the problem is I would bought a house in Tennessee with all the money that I thought I was gonna make off of this, this house in Florida. And so now I've got this house in Florida and now a house in Tennessee and I moved to Grove City. And guess what happened in Tennessee is the same thing. When I bought in Tennessee, things had been piling up on me and then they went back down and then I got to move here. And so now I had a couple houses, then I had to pay rent here on top of that. And I worried, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna, how am I gonna survive this? What's gonna happen? Where are my kids gonna live? We, we started going to school here. Some of you know that like a few months later, uh, or a few years later, here I, went, I, I was divorced. My ex-wife left me, and, and so then I'm dealing with that. And what's that going to do? Can I save my marriage? Is my marriage going to hold together? What's, what's happening? What about my kids? Um, what's going to happen to them? Um, uh, what, are they going to keep following Christ? How am I going to start? Can I even, I've got a call to be a pastor. What do I do with this call now that I'm divorced? What's going what's to go on uh, with my life? And can I stay here even? Will the church want me to stay? Will they let me stay? Can I go pastor some other church? Will some other church want to carry on with a pastor? I've had pastors that call me that were going through this stuff and it was worrisome. And then I, I got through that stuff and that's like, well, should I start dating again? What's that going to look like for my kids? How are they, how's, how is that going to help them in their spiritual life? And what, what's going to go on with them? And, and will I be able to trust somebody again and all that stuff? And I started dating again and that was just, that was a wreck. Um, what do you do with all that stuff? And then I finally meet somebody and then now she's got kids too. So now I gotta worry about my kids and now I, I worry about her kids. And so what, what if we get married, what's that gonna look like? And how's that gonna work out? Is she gonna be able to be a pastor's wife with the people here like her? All, I mean, what do we do with all that kind of junk? Uh, then, then we hit, I become the pastor here. Three years later, I'm the pastor. What's, what in the world's gonna happen with that? And um, a tornado hits the church. That's exciting. Thank you God for that. 
Um, and so what, what do we do with all that and what's going to happen with us as a church? And, and, and we, got, we got through that kind of thing. COVID hits, right? And COVID hits and we're like, what in the world's going to happen with COVID? And, and what do we do with COVID? And people go online and what are we going to do with church online? And, and what happens with all that? And, and, and the, the election's coming up. It'll all be done by the election, right? Then the election's hit and it's worse and things are crazy and nuts. And what are we going to do with all that? And who's going to win the election? And is there going to be riots after the election? And then somebody had sent me this video in June of this prophet who was prophesying all these crazy things that he had seen happening and they'd all happened. And then he had a prophecy for September and then a horrible one for November. It was going to be bad. War, pestilence, all sorts of things in America. And people send me this stuff so I can worry more. Now, what do you think of this? I don't know. I don't, so I, I get all this stuff and I'm in the midst of all that wondering what in the world do I do with all of this stuff? And some of you may look at me and say, Pastor Dale, you're, you're a pastor. You're not supposed to worry about this stuff. You don't, you don't appear that you worry all the time. And there are things that have helped me through that, but these things at times can choke out the love of God in my life. They like hem me in, kind of like I am right now. I feel like I can't move and I'm claustrophobic and God, what are you gonna do? And some of you I know are going through that because you've called me even this week. Um, wondering what's going to happen. I, I apologize to you, those over there that can't see me because of the boxes or <laughs> those of you around there that can't see. I have to look on the screens. But this is what life becomes like for some of us sometimes. We have the privilege here at the church of having a Spirit of Peace Clin Clinical Counseling Center. And um, one of the benefits is that I get to see the counselors as they walk up and down the hall. And so a lot of times I wait for like 10 minutes till the hour and I walk outside my office to wait for the counselors to get out of their session. And then I can walk along the hallway with them until they get to the work, uh, the workstation and uh, print off their copies and things. And I get free counseling that way. It's awesome. Um, so you might want to hang around like 10 minutes till the hour. That's when they release their clients and they go and you can walk the halls and just get free counseling. That's what I do. Just kidding. Um, the, one of the counselors here though, Todd Warren, he and I talk every once in a while. Todd and his wife are members here at the church. And uh, he shared something with me about a year ago that stuck with me about worry, about anxiety. So watch this video real quick of how, what Todd found that kind of helped him work through a lot of his worry. Hey, Naz family, Pastor Dale here. Um, this morning with me is Todd Warren. Uh, Todd and his wife, Rhonda, are members here at the Naz, uh, along with their four boys. They attend regularly. You've probably seen them around. Todd is also uh, one of the counselors at Spirit of Peace Clinical Counseling Center. And uh, we're so fortunate to have them around. Todd, it's, thank you so much for being willing uh, to do this with me uh, today to help our people understand some things. What, what happens is here at, at the church, I get to bump into uh, some of the counselors here and there, and they often will share some insights with me or things that are going on. And Todd shared something with me a number of months back about worry. And so would you share with them a little bit about what you learned mm -hmm. about and how those kind of things help? Absolutely. Back when I was in uh, grad school and even back in college, I would refer to myself as a, now as a recovering worrier, but I worried quite a bit back then. There would be a lot of things that I would think about that I would, I would wonder if they were going to be, they were going to come true. Uh, one thing that uh, really helped was when I was uh, in, uh, it was actually in college, I had a professor who said, uh, never ask a client to do an intervention that you're not willing to do yourself. And it was this cognitive behavioral therapy class that I was in, and she had us do a worry journal. Uh, she had us uh, write down things that we were worried about and then actually write out what actually would happen. Uh, good thing she didn't have us read share those things with her, but she had us write a little reflection paper on the experience. And, and so what it was is you get a notebook and you put a line down the middle uh, vertically. And on one side, you write out the things that you're worried about, just a few sentences uh, of each thing that you're worried about. Then on the other side, you actually write what happens when those things kind of resolve themselves. And what I found was that out of that 13 weeks, I didn't have any that were correct. None that really actually even happened. And so the first line of my reflection paper for that, for that class was, I am a horrible predictor of my own future, and that's a good thing. And I actually continued to do that for about another year and a half after that. And I had about 409 entries, and I only had three that were actually right. 
So I learned that uh, when it comes to predicting the future, when it comes to those things that I'm actually worried about, only about 0.75% of those actually happen. So I usually round that up to about 1%. So my, my saying or the mantra that I have in my head when I start to worry is I tell myself, well, that's the 1%. There's 99% of something else that's going to happen that's probably going to be much better than what I'm actually thinking about. Yeah, you're a worse predictor of the future than the weathermen. Um, I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all you have to do is, 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 all I have to do is think about what I'm going to uh, think is going to happen. And I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's probably not going to happen. Thanks, Todd. Um, some of you may be like Todd. I know as I talk to Todd and as I, I think about worries or anxieties that come in my life, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a better predictor than Todd, I'm sure. Um, and so I like to think that until you actually keep a worry journal and you begin to find out, oh, I worry about way more than actually happens, but we can let these things creep in on us. I wanna to talk to you real quick about this word worry or anxiety as it shows up in your scriptures. Uh, you may find that some people you talk to, I'll talk to people sometimes, oh no, I don't worry, I'm not a big worrier. Okay, and then they're, no, but they're anxious about things. I'm a little anxious about that, a little anxiety. You realize it's the same word, okay? In Greek, it's the same word. It's translated worry or anxious or having anxiety. It's the same sort of thing. How do we, how do we deal with that anxiety when it comes along our way? Here's what, here's what the Bible describes the word merimnao or uh, merimna there in the Greek in this particular passage, what it means is literally it's drawn in opposite directions, something that's being pulled apart, um, divided into parts, or it goes to pieces because it's being pulled apart by anxiety or worry. Um, things, that I, things that I'm thinking of, it's having a foot in two different worlds. You'll recall earlier in Matthew chapter five and six, uh, Jesus talked about having a single eye, having things unified. Scripture tells us God is one. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything together, unified as one. That's very important in a Hebrew understanding of life. When life begins to be torn apart or disjointed, uh, that is not a good thing. That's what anxiety is. That's what worry is. It's having a foot in a world of reality and a foot over here in an imaginary world. Does that make sense? So um, what ends up happening with us as we get torn is quite often we're torn between what is actually happening and our imagination of what's gonna happen in the future, what's gonna take place. Uh, let me read it to you this way. We are most often torn between reality and some anxiety that we have about the future, or some of you in the room, myself included, are torn between reality and some sort of anxiety from our past that is creeping in. We don't only worry about things in the future. There, there are things, I, the selling of my house. Okay, let's talk about selling my house in, in Florida. Okay, I, I, wanted to sell, I wanted to sell it, I couldn't sell it. Um, I was gonna make a ton of money on this house. And by the time I finally realized I was dropping the price on the house, huge chunks at a time. Um, until it finally got to where I was gonna lose money on selling the house. So I just rented it out. Now I went down one time after a renter had moved out and went to go fix it and a lady and my church called me and said, hey, I've got these two older guys that I, I've been cleaning their house for a long time and they're having to move and they needed a place to rent. And it was about the same size as your house. Would you be interested in talking to them? So Wayne, Bonnie and his brother moved in. His brother has since passed away, but Wayne watches every once in a while. How you doing Wayne uh, from Naples? Wayne's in his seventies. Uh, so I don't have to worry about parties and stuff like that that happened at the house. Um, this lady uh, that helped me find Wayne, she actually goes and cleans the house every two weeks. And so I've got a friend that cleans the house and takes care of it. And so that worked out my house in Nashville um, after I think two years here, year and a half here, was able to sell that and I didn't lose my shirt on it. And so that, that kind of got, that kind of got taken care of. Um, my, the stuff here at the church, um, you know, it's kind of crazy. Not only did they not fire me here and I was able to stay a pastor, but three years later I became the, the lead pastor here. I mean, it was nuts the way some of my fears got worked out. Now my kids, um, I still pray for them. I still, I still worry, but they've been able to keep their eyes focused on Christ. And so there's moments where I still, like I said, I still worry, I'm still concerned about them. Um, my marriage didn't work out, right? My wife, my wife left, uh, she didn't come back. And so then I began to worry what's, what's gonna happen. Sometimes that still kind of creeps back in, but then um, am I ever gonna get married again? Am I gonna find somebody else? 
And um, I found some, no, no engagement announcement, you can relax. Um, but um, Melissa's in the front row so she can relax. I'm not gonna ask her in front of everybody. Um, so that, that's working out good, but she's got kids too. And so how are things gonna work out with her kids? And how are they, how are my kids gonna love her? And how, how so there's still these worries now, of, as, as life's gone on, not many of them ended up as bad as what I thought they were gonna end up. In fact, as I continued to seek God and what he wanted, these things kind of tended to work out. There's still moments though, where I look at the things that didn't work out. You know, it didn't quite work out with my marriage. And so there's moments that that anxiety or fear can creep back in. Is it reality? Does it have anything to do with what's going on right now? Well, no, but it's still there, right? I, I've gotta do something with that. And some of you deal with those kind of fears and those kind of anxieties and those kind of things. And so how do we, how do we deal with them? Now I'm gonna to talk to you uh, about what scripture has to say about this. Um, but as we, as we walk through this, I want you to realize and, and write this down. So I don't tell you all to write stuff down much, but take out your phones or if you're watching online, it should be on your home guide. You can go to the nas.church slash home guide, or if you've got the NAS app, this will be in your notes, but circle this one or highlight it or do something with it. This is something else Todd mentioned as we continued our little discussion. And it's actually, I went and looked it up. It's a paraphrase uh, from a Stoic philosopher by the name of Seneca. Um, Seneca said, worry, is more a reflection of your state of mind than it is a reflection of the state of your reality. Let me read that to you again. Worry is more a reflection of your state of mind than it is a reflection of the state of your reality. Sometimes, oftentimes, we can get caught looking at what we have imagined reality to be and, and oftentimes it's our worst case scenario, as Todd mentioned, and we think that's what is. That is not the reality of what is. That says more about your state of mind than it does what's really going on. So what they're trying to say. So how do we get to that place in our state of mind where we, get, where we become anxious? Part of it is fear for tomorrow. When COVID hit, what's that gonna mean? Some people we heard about this mass loss of jobs I stand with people some days who are going, oh, that, ended up, that didn't end up nearly bad, as bad as I thought it was gonna be. And I said, it didn't for you, but I get to pastor a whole bunch of people and hear about people who actually lost their jobs. So it became a reality for them. What about the sickness and disease that's going around? You know, are we gonna get it? Are we not gonna get it? Should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? What about all that stuff? Well, for most of us, we're going, okay, it seems to be going okay, but for some, it's not. I was on the phone yesterday with people from here in our congregation who are asking, pray for a family member. Just this morning, someone came up to me just before the service and said, can you pray for my mom and my dad? They're in their 80s and 70s and um, they're in the hospital with COVID. Or they're, they're not in the hospital right now, they're, they have COVID. You pray for them. Um, I get phone calls from people who have it. I get phone calls from people who are in the hospital. These things are reality, but for most of us, it's not reality, but the fear can shape us. The fear can cause us to pull back. Now, what begins to happen, especially as we head into winter and things get dark and they get dingy and the more our mind focuses on those kind of things, our bodies are made in such a way, God's made us in such a way where when we get the right amount of sunlight, when we have fellowship, when we have friendship, when we have relationships that are positive and things going on in our life, our body produces endorphins that help us cope with things. They give us a positive outlook on life that help us begin to move forward and overcome things that are tough. If our body's not producing the right amount of those endorphins, guess what begins to happen to our brain? We begin to think a little more over here in our imaginary world of what's gonna go bad, of what's gonna go wrong. Our thoughts tend to go to those things rather than things that are helpful that can help us move forward. And sometimes we get stuck out here and some of us get stuck in this spiral that the more I think that way, the worse my thoughts become, the worse my endorphins become, the more depressed I get, the more anxious I get. And it's, it's a reality for many of us. Many of you are dealing with that. I had a, call, I had a number of calls this week, one in particular from, from someone who is dealing with anxiety. And as we walked through that, the reality is they realize what they've got to work through, but it's gonna take a while for their body to, to get back at equilibrium. Some of you need to spend more time with people that are positive. <laughs> Some of you are going, I can't move out of my house. What am I gonna do? 
become the positive person in the house. Some of you need to, you need to go see a counselor and talk with a counselor who can help you with some coping strategies like Todd spoke about. There may be other things that they can help you begin thinking about that would help you in your life. For some of you, it may have been to a point where your body is not producing the endorphins that it needs and doctors can get, prescribe you something that would help you. Okay, so if you're on medication, don't hear me saying today, quit your medication, just pray. and go. I'm not gonna say that. Sometimes your body needs that to get back on track to begin helping you get your mind settled on the right things. But for all of us, there's some very clear things in scripture that God tells us that can help us to work through these things, whether we're on medication, not on medication, whether we're talking to a counselor, not talking to a counselor. You heard me joke about talking to our counselors here in the hallway. I actually have a counselor that I go and speak to about a lot of those things. And a lot of what he is, is my reality slap in the face. When I start telling him all these things that I'm thinking, and what about this, and what about this, and what about this, uh, he's very blunt, he's very direct, he's the kind of person that I need, where sometimes he just laughs at me and goes, you really think that's gonna happen? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And he explains why it's not gonna happen. And I'm going, you really don't think so? No, okay. And sometimes I just need that slap in the face. Sometimes I need someone around me. Sometimes I need my kids just to hug me and say, dad, I love you. Sometimes that's all I need. Some of us are missing out on those things. How do we begin to find that in our lives that God's helping us to have? Are you listening to me, church? So don't hear me saying those things aren't important. Those things are important, but let's, let's work into a little more scripture here. I want you to take out your Bibles if you've got them with you. We're gonna to turn to Philippians chapter four, verse eight. If you have a Bible with you that you don't have to plug into the wall or recharge, raise it up for me real quick. All right, there we go. We got some people with some, with some Bibles. If you have a Bible that you have to plug in, go ahead and take it out. Um, and open it to, to Philippians chapter four, Philippians chapter four. And so this next part of the sermon, we're gonna run through fairly quick here. Uh, Philippians four, four to eight, Paul says this, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice, say rejoice. rejoice. That's pretty good. Say it again louder, rejoice. rejoice. There we go, that's what we did earlier today. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder. I'm gonna, you're gonna hear my praises roar, right? In the midst of the trials, rejoice. Paul says, whatever's going on, rejoice. Sing praise to God. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming, okay? I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It said, the Lord is coming soon. Look busy, okay? <laughs> Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Say pray about everything. They don't like this. Don't worry about anything. Jesus tells us that in Matthew 6. Don't worry. Oh, okay. I'll just stop, like it's that easy, right? Don't worry, oh, and that's all it took. You just tell me, don't worry, I won't. I worry. So Jesus says, Paul says, don't just don't worry, pray. You worried about stuff? Pray about it, take it to God. Pray about everything and thank him for what he's done. Tell God what you need, thank him for what he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Um, some of y'all have said, I've gotten phone calls, emails, texts. Pastor, we're loving this series. Y'all have been preaching through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's, it has hit at home. And you need to know it is wearing your pastoral team out because it seems like every week we go to preach a particular topic, God slams something in our life uh, to bring it more home. So I'm preaching on worry and anxiety this week. So guess what hit me? Worry and anxiety, right? So I'm, so I'm dealing with all this stuff. A few weeks ago, uh, somebody was preaching on anger and they had something happen in their life that made them angry and they're going, wow, can I even preach this? I'm so angry and I've got to preach about anger. You know, we've got all these crazy things that happen. So as I'm, as I'm this last week, I was at my sister's house and uh, I watched her church with her online. Uh, her pastor is one of my really good friends. And uh, guess what he preached about? Anxiety. Right? And then on the way home in the car from Nashville, Brooke, Brooke wanted to share with me a couple of her new favorite preachers that she watches online. And so she was showing me their sermons, neither of which were mine. I was very offended um, as she showed me these guys. And, but one of them preached on anxiety. This buddy of mine in Nashville, I called him and I said, okay, you, you had a saying in your sermon and I, I'm not sure I agree with it. So we argued for a bit and so I altered it just a little bit. Uh, out of this passage, I want you to read, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything, verse six says. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace. This friend of mine said that anxiety and peace are not the opposite. 
when I called my friend and began arguing with him, I said, yeah, yeah, they are. So we walked through everything. Um, he had a response for that. So here's what I want to say to you. I'm going to paraphrase what he said and said this, say this. If you're living in a world of anxiety, no doubt you're wanting peace, right? Quite often we want to figure out how do I get to the place where I can be at rest and I can have peace and I just, I need out of this mess that I'm in. There is a bridge. My friend actually said that, that the opposite of anxiety was this bridge that I'm going to tell you about. And I said, that's not the opposite. It's just the bridge that gets us to peace. The bridge between anxiety and peace you find right here in Philippians chapter four, verse six, verse eight, verse six, sorry. It's Thanksgiving. I know some of you are saying Thanksgiving was Thursday, Pastor Dale, that's done, we're on to Christmas. What he's saying is this, the more I thank God for what he has done, the more I begin to understand what he has already done. It's like, I've talked to y'all about, whenever I look at my problems, it's like taking a microscope and looking at them, they appear way bigger than they are. But the telescope of praise and thanksgiving to God, announcing all the great things that he has done, begins to shift my focus on how massive and awesome and great he is and my problems become very, very small. Amen. They're not gone, but they're pushed out of the way because I realize my God is way bigger than that. So if I wanna move from a place of anxiety to a place of peace, it happens as I begin to thank God for what he's done, as I praise him for what he's done, as I rejoice always, even in the bad times. In fact, this guy that I was talking to today, uh, not today, but earlier this week, um, in the comment, he's in our comments as we were talking, he was struggling with this stuff. And I said, I'm, I'm excited for you. Not right now, but I'm excited for what God's gonna do. He said, what do you mean? I mean, this is the worst thing I've ever gone through. I said, I know. So you realize how strong you're gonna be when you come out the other side of this? When other little stuff comes your way that used to bug you, you're gonna go, that's nothing. My God brought me out of this. You're gonna be so much stronger on the other side. I said, I know you don't wanna hear that right now. That is not something that you wanna hear. But as you praise God and thank him for what he is going to do, you begin living in the reality of the peace that he has for you. Quit living in the fear and the anxiety of this imaginary, I'm gonna be killed, I'm gonna be destroyed, this is gonna be horrible, this is gonna be terrible. Begin to live in the peace that God has for you. Thank him for what he's already bringing about and he will begin to work that in your life. Um, the next verse, verse eight, verse eight. This is the one I've been wanting to get to. So now brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Um, as I read that passage last week, as I was preparing this message, I read through that passage and uh, I did something over Thanksgiving break. I didn't, I didn't look at the news much on my phone. I didn't watch the news on television. I didn't look up all sorts of new stuff. And uh, as I had quit looking at those things, my outlook was getting a little bit better about life and what all was going on. And some people might say, well, it's because you just didn't know what was going on. It was horrible. You should have watched the news. No, I should have. Um, as I read through this, think of it this way. Now, brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what's true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Does any of that sound like social media or the news? No, none of it does, does it? So what God was saying to me is, turn off your social media, turn off the news. Okay, for me, I'm not saying that for y'all. But if I'm gonna focus my mind on the things that God has for me, that means taking my mind off all these things and putting my mind on the things that he has in, for me in his word the places that he wants to guide me, the place where he wants to bring life to me. As I began reading God's word more and get away from the news more, my outlook on life just shifts. So here, I wanna leave you all today with some things, some very practical tools of what can happen, okay? Once you begin to do these things, God does things in your life. It took longer than I wanted, but my house finally sold. It took longer than I wanted, but my house finally rented. It took longer than I wanted, but we got the church fixed up from after the tornado. Uh, we went online. When we first went online, I was panicked. I'll, I won't lie. What's going to happen to the church? Church is going to be totally different. Lord, how are we going to reach people? How are we going to tell people about Christ? Is this going to work online? Are people going to come to our church? Uh, we continue to have people visit the church every week, despite what else going on with COVID. God has blessed us. We've not had an outbreak. We've not had anything crazy. Y'all have been obeying um, the, the ordinances that have been put in place. Uh, but one of the things that's most exciting for me, I, I asked them this morning, I said, print off for me just since the beginning of November. Since the beginning of November, um, people that have given their heart to Christ. 
Okay, so I'm gonna read you some names. Stephanie, Angie, Rachel, Ashley, Pia, Mabel, Carl, Margaret, Stephanie, Boyd, Tyler, Jeremiah, Jessica, Adam. 13 people. 13 people have given their heart to Christ this month. That's great news. While we're online, where are these people coming from? They're watching online. There's some of your friends that you've told about the Naz. You've told them about Christ. They've gone, they've looked, they've taken that step. God keeps saying to me, okay, you're worried about what's gonna go on, Dale. I'm gonna reach people if you all do these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I know I've preached this before, Matthew 6, I love that part of the passage. I hated this passage, this part about worry, but it's in the middle of talking about worry that God says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not just seek God. I used to say, seek God, seek God first in everything. And this week as I was reading it, I realized he's saying, seek first the kingdom of God. I seek God a lot. Dear God, I need this. Dear God, I want this. Dear God, slay the wicked person. Uh, dear, you're right, I go to God a lot. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God. When I begin to seek his kingdom, what I begin to find is people who are lost and hurting who come to Christ. I've noticed the people that, I, people that I'm around that work at Jordan's Crossing all the time, I would think they would be the most depressed people you've ever been around because they're dealing with people who are down and out day in, day out all the time. You know what their response is? When I look at them and go, how are y'all gonna pull this off? How, where are you gonna get the money for that? We don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? They're saying, God just told us to do it. Since God told us to do it, God's gonna provide it. So we just keep going. We're doing what he's called us to do. And God said, they're seeking the kingdom, Dale. They're doing what I've called them to do. They're not just seeking me on Sunday to praise my name. That's a wonderful thing. But they're seeking my kingdom. They're making it happen during the week. That's why they're not worried. Remember, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, all this other stuff will come along. It's like, oh, okay, God, how do I do that? Philippians 4, 4 to 8 tells us. Real quick, write these things down. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. So say it with me, rejoice. rejoice. Second, pray. Pray about everything. Say pray. pray. Third one, say it with me. Thanks. thanks. Give thanks. Pray always in thanksgiving, thanking God for what he's done, for what he's already going to do, or what he's already done and what he's going to do. Excuse me. Thirdly, or fourthly, fix your mind. Fix your mind on the things of Christ, those things that are good, honorable, pure, trustworthy, right? Think on these things. How do I do that? Uh, do this. Begin by reading the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then I'll throw in, for good measure, the book of Acts. That's where the Holy Spirit began to work through his church. Read those things. You'll begin to see that the stuff we come up against, they came up against. They came up against even harder and worse, and God helped them through it. Whenever I begin to read these stories in the Old Testament and some of them in the New Testament, going, good grief, God, look at the stuff that they had to go through. How did they get through that? And going, God goes, I was with them just like I'm with you. If I could get them through all that, do you think I can't get you through COVID? My church will survive, Dale. Don't you think it can survive? Your people will survive, Dale. Don't you think they'll survive? Put your trust in me. Read the gospels. Uh, I've been amazed lately. I've heard a few different stories of people who, they just said, I'm gonna sit down and start reading the Bible. By the time they got through the gospel of John, they're like, oh my goodness, God has spoken to me through this and they accepted Christ. Listen, if you, if you can't read, if you don't like reading a whole lot, do this for me. Download the Bible app. It's actually located on the NAS app, you can have the Bible app and there's a little place where you can click the little triangle. It'll play the scripture for you so you can just listen to it. Put your headphones in while you're running, just listen to the scripture. It'll transform and renew your mind. Last but not least, begin a worry journal. Write down your worries. Write down the things that you're worried about. God, I'm really worried this is gonna happen. This is horrible. Pray about it, leave it with him. Go back and then write down what actually happens. You wanna begin building your faith? Watch how God begins to answer your prayer and knock down all these worries that you have. Todd said, even without praying, just worrying, he just wrote down in a worry journal. Less than 1% of the things he worried about came true. The same thing's true for almost everyone in this room. God is at work in our life. God is at work in our world. The question is, are you seeking him and allowing him to work in and through you? Would you stand with me real quick? Gracious Father, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you not only tell us not to worry, but you point us to the ways you take care of the birds, the way you take care of the flowers. 
Lord, you point us to places where we can see you working and moving in our world. God, I pray that you'd help us to seek you first, to seek your kingdom. That Lord, as we walk back out these doors, that the waiters that we see, that the people that we come across this week at work, Lord, we would seek your kingdom in their life. We would share your truth with them. God, we would get our eyes off of all the worries that we have around us and we would begin to thank you for what you've done and thank you for what you're gonna do. God, I pray for my brother or sister that's here right now, that maybe they've, they've been worried, they've been anxious, they don't know what their life looks like, Lord. They've been worried about eternity, about what, where are they gonna go when they die, about what's gonna happen, what's this life all about. Lord, they're anxious about all of those things and to hear that you love them, that you've taken care of those things, that you created them because you love them. Lord, I know there's, there's somebody watching online or in the room right now that they're worried that the sin from their past, it's causing them anxiety right now. It's something in the, not something in the future they're worried about. They're worried about this thing that keeps reaching back from their past and grabbing them. God, I pray that you would help them right now to come to you, that they would understand that you knew about that thing. You knew about that thing when you died for them on the cross, that you love them and you want relationship with them. God, help them to hear you say, come unto me. You're weary and you're heavy laden and I will give you rest. You'll find peace for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Lord, that they would, they would ask you to forgive them of their sins, that they would move forward allowing you to lead and guide them in their life. If you wanna pray that prayer, just, just echo that with me right now and say, God, forgive me for all the things I've done. Forgive me for not following you. Forgive me for not trusting you. Forgive me for not believing that you loved me and wanted to forgive me. Lord, help me to turn and walk in you. Help me to learn from you. Help me, Lord, to cast my cares on you, knowing that you care for me. Lord, we ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Naz family. Thank you, Pastor Dale. Wasn't that a wonderful word today? You're watching online. Hit that heart button, like button, whatever. Uh, what a wonderful time. Uh, just talking about some very real stuff for you and for I. Worry, anxiety. I don't know about you, but as they started pulling these boxes up here, I started feeling anxious myself. If that was you, if you're like, yeah, I'm starting to feel that as we look at our own worry, anxiety. But uh, Jesus helps us with that. We're thankful for that. Here's what I want to say. I love that Pastor mentioned the names of those people uh, that began a relationship with Jesus. And if you are one of those people today, you began a relationship with Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. Can we take a moment and, and give them a hand clap, celebrate with them, watch online, hit that hand clap emoji. Um, because we believe it's the greatest decision you'll ever make is Jesus is the way out of anxiety, out of worry, towards purpose, towards new life. If that's you, Here's what we want you to do to connect with us. We want to know about it. Go ahead and hit the button on your screen that said, I said yes. Or if you're in this room, come see us. We'll be socially distant, but we have a Bible uh, that we want to give you. We want to follow up with you, pray with you. Uh, we're very excited about the decisions uh, that you've made. A couple things, a few last steps before you go. Next steps, rather. Things that you can do this week. Seek first the kingdom of God. Pray about what that looks like for you to see the kingdom of God in your life. Check out the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and we're going to include Acts in that as well. Read that. See your mind transformed. Or maybe this week, start a worry journal and just see how God really does come through for you. Here's all I want you to do. If you're seated, go ahead and stand to your feet. We want to do a blessing before you go. If you're watching online, go ahead and put your hands out. Unless you're driving, then hang on to the wheel. No kneel driving today, okay, or knee driving. But hey, go ahead, do this. Put your hands out. Uh, because what we want to do when we do this is we're just posturing ourselves for God, saying, God, I want to receive the gifts and the blessings uh, that you have for me. God loves to bless his kids. So go ahead and put your hands out here. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he smile down upon you and give you favor this week. This week when you feel anxiety, where you feel lonely, when you feel worried, May he lead you to prayer, and may he put a heart of thanksgiving inside of you, and may you speak those words as you move from worry to peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you, church. Be blessed. Have a great week. For those of you that are online, stay online because we have an after-service thing that we want you to check out online. Those of you in this room, 
Ushers, we're going to ask you to go ahead and dismiss everyone. Welcome back, Naz family. I pray and I hope that that message and this service encouraged you and inspired you today. And uh, if maybe you're sitting there and you made that decision to take your next step towards Jesus, and that's amazing. We want to celebrate you. We want to help you take those next steps towards him as well. And if you're one of those people who said yes, go ahead and just text I said yes to 614-532-4842. We'll have some resources for you. We'll, we'll help you take those next steps in a life with him. We're, we want to celebrate you, and we're just thankful for you, and we love you. Um, and maybe you're watching, whether you're watching online or whether you're watching at a later date, there's just a couple of things that you can do also to take that next step towards Jesus Christ. Maybe you watched today's service, and you were encouraged, and maybe it really spoke to you, it reached to your soul. Go ahead and text somebody in the comments on Facebook or on the live stream or send them the YouTube link. Share the podcast with them as well. Share this message with somebody today. You never know who might need it. You never know who it could touch and who it could reach and who it could encourage. Or maybe you just want to dive deeper. Maybe you want to dive deeper into the message by yourself or with your family, with your friends. The Home Guide is a great place to do that. The nas.church slash home guide. You can find notes. You can find discussion questions. Everything you might need just to dive deeper into the message as well. And also just want to reiterate the importance of the NAS app. The NAS app has everything you might need for this service. Um, we have it on Google. We have it on Apple. Whatever you might need, the NAS app has, has the home guide. It has all the links. It has the ways you can stay connected. It has everything you need um, just to stay connected with us as a church, and we can stay connected during these, these crazy, une unexpected, crazy times. And we just love you so, so much, NAS family. Thank you for joining us this week. We love you. We're here for you, and we're there for you.